Aloha mai kako. As Kelo has said, I'm Manuel Mejia, proud father of two small keiki, and lucky husband to my lovely wife Angela in the fourth row. So thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so what does a, a marine conservation have to do with cultivating community? It seems like we just study coral reefs, uh, but really, and, and, and fisheries, but really what I learned throughout um, my career, and, and it's been a great privilege to work with many communities uh, across the Pacific, but most especially in Hawaii, um, where I've learned so much from uh, my friends in the communities. They become friends, and ultimately they become teachers. And they've, they, Hawaii has so many great lessons to share with, with the world in terms of uh, malama aina and caring for the oceans and seas. Um, and so let me start by asking you uh, a question. Um, when you wake up in the morning, what is it about living in Hawaii that you are most grateful for? Yeah, it's a tough one, right? There's so many things to be grateful for. Um, it's kind of an endless list, but for me personally, um, it's a fabulous, it's amazing opportunities that we have as communities to be able to connect with nature. It's so abundant, it's so close by that a lot of places don't have these opportunities, but we, lucky few that live in Hawaii, have this chance. And before I, I go into my story tree, um, I'd like to base it on the host culture, on what makes Hawaii so special. So let's take a step back and see. Here you see the, uh, the eight main islands of uh, the Hawaiian archipelago, of course there are more, there's about 300, and they stretch all the way towards Japan, uh, Papahanao, Mokuakea, the Kupuna Isles. Um, but it's one of the most, it's the most isolated high island chain in the world. And as such, we're very far from continents, and being on an island, uh, the society that evolved here and the culture that came out of this very abundant place while it was abundant, they soon came to find out resources weren't infinite. They realized that they had to take care of food resources, water, in order for them to thrive. And so unlike on the continent where you could possibly kind of migrate westwards or eastward, you have space to move, um, this sense of finiteness, but also um, it, it lends itself to resourcefulness as well and caring for the land. So being 2,500 miles or more from the nearest continent, anything that got here before steamboats or, or jet planes had to get here through and brave transoceanic voyages, either by wind, wing, or, or, or waves. And, um, and as such, it, the flora and fauna here evolved in, in isolation. And uh, had Darwin done his research here, uh, the honeysuckers here would have um, put the finches of Galapagos to shame. It, the, the, the diversity of, of uh, birds and vertebrates on Hawaii uh, is so amazing, and it's very, very endemic. So for a, a landmass its size, anywhere on, on Earth, it's got one of the highest rates of endemism. Uh, in the marine world, for example, 20, about 24% of our reef fishes are endemic, meaning they're found only here, and if we lose them under our watch, if we lose them from this place, we lose them from the world forever. Um, I start with the host culture because the island values uh, that evolved out of this abundant landscape, imagine being one of the first peoples uh, that discover Hawaii, abundant water, thick, verdant forests, and, um, and they soon realized Land is the chief and people are its servants. And if you took care of the land and sea, it, it takes care of you. Um, so it is this setting that this society and culture flourished and achieved amazing things. Um, and they also transformed the landscapes. And over time, however, um, Hawaii has become also an extinction capital of the world. A lot of invasive plants have gotten here and it's wreaked havoc on our natural ecosystems. Today, uh, these are some of the communities I work with. You can see the diversity from um, Heie and Kaneohe, Kiholo Big Island, Hihikinao and Maui, East Maui, Hana, and uh, 
it truly is an honor and privilege to be working with these communities. Um, you learn so much, and, and some of these places are one of the last strongholds of uh, native Hawaiian culture, where they plant and eat kalo on a daily basis and, and harvest fish from the ocean. So it's a very traditional lifestyle. And, and I think Hawaii is one of those uh, microcosms of island earth, or our spaceship earth, as, as you would say. And like as canaries in the coal mine, we have a lot of lessons to share with, with earth about sustainability, but not only about the good things, but also some of the challenges that we face. So for example, in terms of biodiversity loss, here on Oahu, a lot of the native plants are now limited to the very top ridges of the Ko'olaos and the Waianae Ridge. And um, you know, this, this sense of loss, I didn't really fully understand it until I was doing an interview with one of the aunties and, and one of the communities we work with. And we were doing an ecosystem services interview. And the idea was to show that, we, we all know that in Hawaii, um, the environment is the economy and the economy is, is the environment. But we knew it was so much more. We knew that it had cultural underpinnings and it was especially uh, for the Hawaiians, it, it was wrapped up with their self-identity. And it, this light bulb didn't go on for me until I interviewed this auntie who was a very strong lady, uh, full of life and aloha. And uh, she's, she's one of the pillars of strength in her community. And when we got to the question, what would, how would you feel if uh, you lost a lot of the ecosystems that you're familiar with? Street, uh, tears started streaming down her face. Uh, we we kind of broke down. We couldn't go on with the interview. It, it was unexpected um, that such a strong matriarch in this, in this community um, couldn't go on. And I don't know if it, it was because she was holding her child, her newborn child with her, and she thought of all the memories lost if, if the forest in her area were, were to disappear. But then it, it was a sense of loss and almost a grieving for a loved one or, or a family. So it was that intimate relationship with her area uh, that, was, that she was grieving. And in, in the sage words of the late um, Ed Lindsay from Lahaina, if we lose Hawaii and our places, we are nothing but voices in the wind. But I am an eternal optimist. And working with the communities that, I, that I, my colleagues and I work with, we know we face a lot of challenges. There are huge global uh, climate change challenges, rising sea levels. But I also remain optimistic because the kupuna that we work with hold some of the keys, some of the answers. They lived a sustainable lifestyle for thousands of year, um, thousand years. Um, and they made it happen. The, the pre-contact population in Hawaii is pretty close to what it is today, and yet they didn't have any mats and ships to bring in food. They, they grew everything. They had fish ponds to feed their, their people. And so we only need look back for some solutions. Um, this gentleman on the right, he's, he's a living Konohiki, uh, Uncle John Lin from Hana, not only teaches children how to fish in a pono way, um, he holds a lot of the, uh, not just fishing techniques, but he teaches kids how to practice pono fishing, meaning take only what you need, not what you can. And with that relationship uh, and long-term mentality, when you try to catch fish, uh, don't finish it all. After all, um, fish don't lay eggs in freezers. And another reason is all the families in this area depend on this icebox. And so they are, have to be very considerate for the next family that'll fish there. Okay. Another story from here on Oahu. I have not given up on Oahu. Uh, and, and it's because of this wonderful community in Southeast Oahu called uh, Malama Maunalua. This community, this grassroots based organization restored this area. On the surface, Maunalua Bay looks beautiful and, and pretty, but underneath, Things are out of balance. Uh, invasive algae are choking out the reefs. Uh, but what this one community did is started educating the children in the area. A lot of volunteers came out and started weeding this small patch of invasive algae like they were 
it's like a seaside gar uh, a, a garden in the sea, and they started just taking care of that one spot. And we worked with this community, and everybody rallied to tackle and clear a bigger area. And at the end of the project, 27 acres of invasive algae were cleared. Three million pounds of, of invasive algae were given to farmers. Not a single pound went to a landfill. And this invasive limu was used to grow produce and vegetables for the community. So you can see here at the beginning, and less than a year and a half later, they've cleared this much. And by May 2011, they really cleared it, and native species like seagrass started to come back to this area. But it took the entire community to pitch in. A lot of jobs were created. But one of the benefits is that the, the children were discovering this wonderful outdoor living experiment and classroom where they could learn and discover marine creatures. And uh, just a wonderful project that really gives me hope. Another way to um, engage communities is to encourage them to rediscover the history of their place, but also to understand how things have gotten to, the, to where they are today. So with, with this community in Maui, um, they drew the resources first just on the beach, on the sand, and then they transferred that onto butcher paper, and finally to GIS and very georeferenced maps. Um, and what was amazing about this is it wasn't just the natural resources that they put down, but also the cultural resources, where the temple, where the heiaus were. Um, and, and they realized that maps are not just lines on a paper. They contained the stories, the hulas, the chants that these places had, and they were very much alive uh, as they drew the maps. And that kind of inspired them to learn more about how have they gotten to this place. So, we poured over a lot of aerial photographs over time to see the land use changes. And pretty soon they started engaging uh, landowners and, uh, and other parties to start addressing challenges. Okay. Pretty soon uh, communities started, uh, there's this groundswell movement now across Hawaii to revive traditional ways of taking care of um, our oceans. And, um, in this picture in Kenai, we even have uh, the chief, um, the head of the Division of Land and Natural Resources, William Isla, who not only inspired the communities and encouraged them to keep going, but also gave them practical advice on how to work with the state to make it happen so that they can continue to practice traditional practices. Okay. So with um, famous anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, never underestimate or never doubt what a few um, people can do because it's all that has ever changed the world. Now, uh, in this other community, um, there were a lot of outsiders starting to poach and finish their fish in, in this area. And of course, this caused a lot of anger within the community that was very protective of their icebox. And some of the young guys started um, resorting to vigilantism and they started slashing tires and breaking car windows that they didn't know was from there. And so uh, the kapuna sat, sat these young guys down and said, no, this has to stop, this can't go on. Let's plan and let's do a more proactive way to manage our resources. And so today this community group is not interested in raising money, it's, they just want to educate the families in that area as well as the surrounding coastline to really respect and take care of this place because this is where they grew up, this is where they learned how to fish, and to this day, this is where their icebox is. So my call to action, or my kahea and challenge to all of you, is to find your place in the ecosystem, whatever it may be. Every, you all have strengths. Roll up your sleeves and discover your passion out in Hawaii's environment. We are so lucky to have this abundant natural ecosystems all around us. Hawaii has all of the world's biomes, except for tundra, and uh, it's right there outside our doorsteps. Um, and if pulling invasive algae or pulling invasive plants from the forest is not your cup of tea, serve on a board, find your cause, and serve on a board and, and volunteer, because every bit of your contributions help to keep Hawaii a better place to live in. Lastly, I'd like to end with this African proverb. 
If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And there's a role for everyone. And we're all on this canoe together. There's a saying that goes, heva hemoku, hemoku heva. The canoe is an island, and the island is a canoe. And we all have to take care of each other while on the canoe, but also on land. And again, as a, as a microcosm of spaceship Earth, island Earth, we are all in this together. Our fates are tied. This is Hawaii's story. This is your story. This is our story. And if we have each other's backs, these keiki will be fine for the future. On this note of gratitude, I'd also like to thank the Hawaii community as well as the greater global community that's standing in solidarity with the Philippines right now with this outpouring of kukua for the survivors of Typhoon Haiyan. So on that note, I just want to mahalo everyone and thank you for listening.